good afternoon everyone my name is farah khan and i'm working as a research intern at ics i'm the master of ceremony for this seminar it gives me a great pleasure to welcome everyone for another seminar titled china strategy to sustain its monopoly on critical mineral it explores key tactic employed by china to maintain its dominant position in the critical mineral market with soaring consumption and global shift towards sustainable energy technologies the demand for critical mineral is projected to quadruple by 2040 this heightened demand has brought attention to the secure and reliable supply of this vital resources additionally the effect of climate change and ch supply chain crisis has intensified the focus on china's monopoly geopolitical use of critical mineral in disputes with other countries such as senkaku tiao island dispute with japan and the trade war with the us raises concern about china's strategic control over these resources therefore this seminar will dwell into implications of china's dominance and its implications on the global landscape to discuss this crucial topic we have an esteemed speaker with us today ms neha mishra who is an associate fellow at the center for air power studies new delhi she is she is pursuing her phd from university of delhi on the interplay of political economy and clean technologies scrutinizing india china geoeconomic engagement her research interest includes energy transition critical mineral rare earth elements renewable and its geopolitical implications she is currently working on a book project titled strategic use of rare earth elements major power and emerging players today's session will be chaired by mr ravi butalingam who is the founder and chairman of manas advisory gurgaon he is an honorary fellow at the ics he is a member of confederation of indian industry core group on china and sits on the editorial board of china report and world affairs without further ado i'll now hand over the virtual podium to our chair before that our all participant must be muted during the presentation questions can be posted in the chat box during the event or you can raise your hand during the interactive session after the presentation you will be called upon to unmute yourself and ask question please mention your full name and affiliation before asking the question i would now hand over the floor to the chair to take the proceeding forward over to you sir thank you farah and uh, welcome everybody to this wednesday seminar of the institute of chinese studies uh welcome neha we are all eagerly looking forward uh, to your presentation on what is surely a very topical as well as important subject um this matter came to everyone's uh, very focused interest just a few weeks ago with the announcement that china has placed uh, export control orders on the export of gallium and germanium which are two particularly rare uh, elements uh, also uh, of very crucial and critical use in many applications and of course this is not the first time um, uh, as the abstract shows as far back as 2010 uh, there was the instance of the rare earths export from china being uh, being stopped at least for a period of time to japan so uh, how this is going to play out the role of china the role of other countries is going to be very important and i'm sure neha will cover this exhaustively one thing uh, i just one thing i will say neha before handing over to you is uh please also do cover the background of how this monopoly came about and what does it teach us that is countries other than china and what does it teach the chinese about how this situation is evolved because one can see this happening more and more in the days to come with other countries perhaps also using similar instances uh to put what one might call a premium value on the resources that they have which may also at some point be declared as critical how is the planet going to cope with 
us. So having said this, let me once again welcome Neha and now over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so uh, I just want to say hello and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is a very uh, lazy afternoon and I, I hope I won't bore anybody with my, uh, with my presentation on critical minerals. So first of all, I just want to thank Institute of Chinese Studies to just opening up or extending this opportunity and uh, opening this platform for this key uh, topic. So uh, I'll just share my screen to start. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it's visible. Yeah, okay. I'll start now, sorry. So, first of all, uh, thank you. So, this talk is all about China's strategies to sustain critical minerals dominance. And uh, as you already heard about uh, the, the background, what is the abstract is about, and what has been the history and uh, the recent trend which, the, uh, which uh, Mr. Butalingam has uh, mentioned. So before going into China's monopoly, I'll just give you one outline uh, what is this presentation is going to focus on. Uh, what are critical minerals, global reserves and production, why their security is important, China's critical mineral strength, limits and challenges of China, and strategies to sustain the monopoly. So uh, if we see uh, what are critical minerals, before going into any explanation about how China came into monopoly, what is going on, what has been the history, we should know what is uh, what is this, these, what are these minerals about. We should know uh, their, obviously their periodic table is in front of you, how they are, uh, uh, un, they can be understood in terms of chemistry level, but to, Beyond that, in layman term, how they are important, why, why they are called as critical minerals. So if you can see here that you can see three categories. One is the yellow yellow ones, which are critical, and the essential ones, which are really important right now, which are going on uh, in all the countries focus, and the red ones are the rare earth elements. So the definition of minerals are as critical always varies depending on the time and space. So you can, all these minerals are critical, but at the same time, their criticality will be depending on the time and space they are being used in. So if you are th thinking about right now, obviously these are the, the other minerals are like critical minerals, essential, chromium, manganese, nickel, uh, zinc, and cobalt. These are the critical minerals of current times. And also there is a, there is a confusion. From, uh, also I noticed when you were mentioning that rare earth elements and critical minerals are not same. Critical minerals are a full uh, set and rare earth elements are the subset of critical minerals. So people always confuse uh, critical minerals with rare earth elements and they think that all the critical minerals are rare earth elements. But no, for instance, nickel is not rare earth element. Uh, cobalt is not rare earth elements. So this is just to explain the, uh, or just to clear the confusion uh, around. and. Uh, if we see the criticality around it, for instance, it was the, it was US that made the first list of critical minerals in during the World War One. It was uh, even termed as the minerals of or list of war minerals. It included minerals that were critical at that time. For instance, uh, they were nickel, platinum, nitrates, potash. So they, these were used during that time in the war uh, equipments or military equipments. So different countries have different uh, concept about critical minerals and they explain, they consider a mineral as critical based on their supply chain crisis and shortage of that supply. So 
most common 16 critical minerals I have found in all countries uh, concern are among these. So if you see zirconium and uh, rare earth element, zinc, and other kind of minerals, they are very important right now. Not every mineral if you in the list is important for all countries. That shows how criticality varies upon the based on the time. So if we see application of critical minerals, the importance is uh, all attached in, uh, in, in daily life. You, you, you don't see only in terms of defense equipment or clean energy. It's everywhere. Even the laptop I'm using, it has critical mineral. The, the specs I'm using to just see properly and clearly, it also has rare earth elements used. So everything has critical mineral and rare earth. All, the, in, all life life uh, functioning is based on critical minerals. So we cannot deny their uh, their security. We, we have to secure the access of those uh, minerals to our functioning, our economy and future growth. So these are, if you see mo mostly five top industry that rely on critical minerals are telecommunication and electronics. If you see the Apple, uh, the energy, defense, aerospace, transportation, if you see the EVs. So Critical minerals are everywhere. E either it is um, right uh, daily life or it's a uh, defense equipment or everything. So if we see the countries with critical mineral strength, China, you, you can see here that China has the major critical mineral strength uh, in comparison to other countries. Uh, it has germanium, which recently got export curb, uh, graphite, rare earth element, vanadium. So th these ones are the highest uh, amount China has in comparison to other ones. Uh, um, followed by, we, we have African countries, we have Australia also, we have US also. But in terms of strength, the biggest strength of production and processing and uh, reserves, China is the major key here. So there, there comes the strength in terms of reserves and production. If while securing access to critical mineral is important. Everybody is uh, uh, understanding critical minerals is important in that way or this way, but why they are important for all the countries to seek or man maintain the res resilience of their supply chain in for the future and everything. W what factors have made the world to realize that way? So first, we have seen the geopolitical events around them. If you uh, the first geopolitical events, as you also mentioned, the 2010 Senkaku Island dispute, when uh, China used the the critical the export or uh, curb of rare earth elements against Japan, when Japan uh, was using the geopolitical or military action against China, so it, it it China could easily use the military action in response, but it it re used the other way, it used the export embargo way to uh, punish Japan and it, it really worked in its favor because Japan's aut automobile industry really struggled that time. Its economy struggled, its GDP struggled that year. And that was the major event that made the world realize this is, a this is the time we have to focus on strengthening our supply chain and re reduce the single uh, dependency on a single country. Then also then trade war happened. That was the second major, uh, major, uh, problem or major event that made the world realize and um, obviously US was the major supplier major importer of rare earth elements from China because it was pr pr producing it was extracting the elements it was exporting to China for the manufactured elements and the whole uh, supply chain was disturbed for in USA and for the other countries and then the recent uh, the export curve of germanium and gallium we have seen how uh, it has been uh, the topic of discussion and uh, it is going to impact a lot uh, of China in uh, America's defense industry because it uh, it is really dependent on germanium and gallium to produce high amount of military equipments. So if you see the other factor is supply chain crisis. In the past uh, few years, a number of events have shown that international value chain have uh, major flaws. Uh, there have been unprecedented storms, fl floods, and there have been multiple events that have made the world realize how uh, how flawed our uh, supply chain has been. And 
if we the take take the case of uh, massive in, in disruption that has been caused by covid pandemic then it was by war in ukraine and then rising china us tension there were shipping delays there were the environment environmental social and governance issues everything was there so if you can see that these are the four factors that have been causing supply chain risk environmental geopolitical economic technological so most of the most uh, disturbing factors were geopolitics and economics these have been affecting the supply chain and made the world realize to focus on four key areas supply security energy transition talent development and increase their adaptability to sustain resilience in the growing supply chain crisis and the third factor is global energy transition we all know that the global commitment to reduce emission in intensity and achieve their national determined contribution of of major high importing high industrialized countries they have been uh, trying to accelerate their demand they have been trying to accelerate their uh, potential their initiative to reach that goal and for that they need to uh, uh, sustain the demand sustain their security or sustain their supply of critical minerals and to, to secure this access they have been trying in multiple ways to strategy through policies so this is one of the factor if you see that they they what kind of uh, critical minerals are used in sol solar technology wind technology and also the electric vehicles significantly out of these all neodymium dystrosium nickel lithium cobalt and others are the major uh, minerals that are being used in clean energy and clean technologies so these three factors you can see are the major uh, drivers of world to see the the access to critical minerals is really important so that there is a reason they they are trying to sustain their resilience now we comes to china's critical mineral strength why china has the strength when other countries does not so if you see china out of all the critical minerals china strength lies majorly in rare earth elements it follows by nickel lithium cobalt and copper and other but rare earth industry growth goes back to 1980s when when it was uh, it, it launched its high tech innovation program and that time us was the major leader in rare earth elements not everybody knows but the us was the key supplier the world was reliant on us that time but with the environmental regulation imposed on usa during 1980s by international atomic energy regulation they uh, imposed regulation on uh, usa that you have to follow certain uh, environmental uh, trends otherwise you cannot continue uh, extracting thorium and other kinds of minerals so that imposed a real regulation that imposed a real restriction on usa and kind of there that was the phase usa started declining and that was the same time china started increasing because china understood the strategic importance of that time china uh, uh, entered into geo entered into research entered into mining entered into produ producing processing so every aspect of rare earth elements china has been a part of it and china tried to develop everything at one at one place if we see the world everything is scattered one country has producing power one country has processing power one country has extraction but nothing no country has everything at one place which china has because it is not a one day progress it has been a 30 years 40 years progress for china so we that is the strength we are talking about so if you see the uh, the leading countries in terms of rare earth reserves and production china is really um, really the leading in terms of reserves as well as in terms of production while it follows by you know, usa australia even india is in the in the whole uh, list but obviously india is really going into the direction to develop its potential but it's not there yet which we have seen uh, with the new critical mineral list if we see other potential so china is leading in terms of battery market china has been the leading source of batteries in terms of lithium and other kinds of batteries not only in terms of domestic production it always seeks control of the or secure the access to the outside sources and 
in in china has been developed as the key or the leading supplier or leading uh, producer of electric vehicles because of the uh, because of being the key sub, uh, producer of battery mark, battery uh, bat lithium ion ba batteries and nickel batteries and if you see the global energy transition china is dominating in clean energy metals as well most of the countries so in here i just want to explain a kind of difference so when we are talking about clean uh, critical minerals they have three levels upstream midstream and downstream so the upstream and midstream uh, it's a, it's more like a geological or geographical thing but i just want to clarify to the audience that when you're talking about uh, upstream upstream and midstream it's more about extraction mi mining and production of critical minerals like rare earth elements and others but when you are talking about downstream it's more about processing those uh, produced minerals and making them to a level of manufactured end product which this downstream processing capacity downstream level is not there with every country where china is the, the major uh, country which is supporting the whole world with the processing capacity uh, if you see here also copper nickel cobalt rare earth lithium all of them have all of these are produced in different different countries but if you see the other way the production the processing capacity is all in china in, in terms of any kind of mineral so uh, there comes the strength of china in critical mineral industry which other countries lacks so how china dominates the critical mineral supply chain as i have explained i uh, uh, just a uh, intro about it but uh, i'll give you a more explanation around it so first is high reserves and production capacity as i have explained supplier to the world technology monopoly research and development domestic policies and government subsidy and strategic and geopolitical leverage over the world so if you see that china share of critical minerals in both uh, reserves and production it is leading in the world and mostly in terms of rare earth and that follows by copper that follows by zinc that follows by nickel all also magnesium so manganese sorry so these are the major store stored uh, or uh, reserves of china which are, is making china to lead in the critical mineral sector and these are also important for uh, key uh, technologies like clean energy defense defense equipment and everything that i i i have already explained and in terms of production also china is leading and key is rare earth production and if we see the leading supplier and import potential china has been exporting and its exporting capacity has been increasing year by year in the past and if you see the ex importing capacity also china has been importing a high level of uh, uh, these minerals if either it is copper lithium manganese nickel platinum all kind of minerals china has been importing so you can uh, we can see here that china is trying to engage in the market in both terms exporting and importing so that the countries which is importing from china will be dependent on china as well as china, which are exporting to china will be dependent so there is always a engagement at both levels which creates a kind of interdependency with china and china can always choose to you know cut away from that interdependency through using its multiple strategies which i will explain in the later slides Uh, if you see the china's technology monopoly yes battery manufacturing is there hi in highest amount with china uh, no other country has that much manufacturing capacity of batteries like china has china is uh, coming up with 6g communication network china has the highest uh, advanced um, uh, advanced level of artificial intelligence which is going to leading going to be the lead leader in the world as well it is all because of the source because of the critical mineral strength advanced research and development this research and development also goes back to the 1980s time when china started to develop laboratories and institutions around uh, critical minerals because critical mineral was the key strength of china started with it so, and then in terms of chemistry and everything china started with laboratories under peking university changchun institute of applied chemistry and the main credit goes to uh dr shu quanxian who who is even considered as the father of china's rare earth industry he was someone who came up with a revolutionized way of 
production producing rare earth in china because uh, that time us was declining because of the environmental issues and this person this professor he came up with new uh, kind of chemistries which can which could save china from those environmental regulations which us was facing because otherwise china could also face the same thing in the future which us faced and declined so and other uh, factor is in order to secure their domestic supplies the resource policies have always focused on, on setting the targets for efficient resource use for china and they always try uh, they they're also trying on recycling of raw materials which other countries are, are also trying in terms of recycling japan is leading in, uh, in the world but china is entering into the domain also which shows how china is always trying to secure its access in one way or or the other if you see the domestic policies and government support yes china in china the domestic policies and government support has been the best one because china has been, uh, in but at the same time china has been, uh, has a very involuntary centralization of domestic mining uh, operation if a, if a, um, if a company wants to mine in, in china which is uh, in china they, they have to take permission they have to make a chinese uh, there is a committee called uh, chinese uh, uh, chinese community party uh, no sorry that is uh, in a uh, yeah so th whenever they they create uh, any company ex exploration when government government issued a declaration they have to define strategic minerals with them and they have to make a mandatory agreement with the chinese uh, committee which is uh, supposed to regulate all the mining sectors in china after that once it is done in all the companies are represented of chinese chinese communist communist party will be there to regulate the, their functioning their operation in china so it is all done under government regulation but at the same time they open up all the mining parties or mining operations to private enterprises which which right now india lacks india does not have private companies as such available in the mining sector like china has because china uh, tries to regulate but at the same time tries to com compete with all the private uh, and uh, you know inclusions and if you take the case of strategic and geopolitical leverage yes china has highest uh, china has shown how it can use the resources in its favor uh, in uh, at multiple times it started in 2011 but it never stopped it has we, we have seen multiple cases which i have already explained but the recent one was the eye opener because that that was the time because china was not even showing that uh, kind of gesture that it will uh, stop or export do the export curb of germanium or gallium but uh, in the past also china has been very uh, chi china has been surprising the world with such rules or such kind of actions and then uh, challenges to china so we, i have explained how what strength china got with it in the past and in the few in the current time and how it is securing the future as well but challenges what challenges china has been facing in in, in the recent times so that there are changing trends in terms of reserves and production as uh, and there are high domestic consumption of critical minerals in china there are high cases of illegal mining there are environmental and cost limits for china as well there are global initiatives to reduce dependence on china so if we take the case of uh, compare like if we compare the trends from like to 2010 to 2020 even they you can see that how china was exporting um, china was uh, having the reserves of around 90% of the world at time but right now it it has gone down to around 68 to 69% which shows or 58 58% is 2020 but right, right in 2022 it it was uh, a bit higher it was 63% so in terms of my reserves also it has been declining production terms it has been declining which which reflects on china then how much uh, how, how much uh, uh, you know resource uh, abundance has been used and how much you have left with you have to uh, china cannot uh, exploit all the uh, resources in the future and be, stay without its uh, uh, strength of rare earth elements and if you see the high domestic consumption yes it has it has been highly consuming these minerals as well 
it has been exporting it has been importing as well how much how if you are exporting a lot of minerals you are importing the same level so there is no not going to be a progress in that direction and china is been it has been really reliant on these minerals for its technology production it's it's a electric vehicles uh, production growth and so on if it uh, and high, there are high cases of illegal mining in china which china has been trying to restrict china has been trying to exp, impo, uh, impose control on these kind of uh, cases but uh, uh, there are there are no there no there are currently going to they, they have been multiple increase and there have been uh, multiple cases that that are showing even after all the regulations and uh, in that cases china is trying china cannot uh, survive with with its pricing controls whenever it rises because if it, illegal mining is already going on in the domestic sector it can always always cope up with the foreign sector and foreign investor and uh, keep the chinese strategies down so that is one of the challenge for china as well as well and then if we take the case of environmental and cost limits there are a lot, lot of environmental limits for china because uh, there was a time when it came up with one kind of chemistry under professor shi guangxian but uh, time has been changing uh, resources have been declining uh, reserves have been declining so in, in, with the same time you have to uh, china is trying to improve its environmental strategies as well because once it will be affecting the environment it will be a danger for the people it will be danger for its mining sector and maybe it will be put down to a, a, st a stake or stay or maybe it maybe the the organization international atomic energy agency maybe they can put a regulation on china as well so then in that sector china is facing the challenges and in terms of cost yes cost is also high in terms of mining processing producing so in other sectors china is also focusing on re recycling and entering into other kind of cheaper domains so that china can save on these uh, illegal mine uh, in uh, environmental and cost limits and if we see the global initiative to reduce dependence on china there are multiple initiatives going on since 2011 but mostly after 2018 we have seen quad focusing on critical minerals we have seen india japan australia supply chain resilience we have seen all the um, pre importing high importing dependent countries they are coming up with their critical mineral list they are coming up with their uh, they are coming up with their critical mineral list they are coming up with their strategies to deal with supply chain a crisis and everything so where they may mostly the goal is to reduce dependency on a single country like china so what strategies china in, in wants or china is trying to secure its monopoly in the sector first is china is investing in uh, the all the key uh, strategic mines of the world major chinese ma mining acquisitions you can see is in uh, mostly is it, it's in africa because africa so there china is using a, from a very long time a geo economic engagement that is called, that that has been seen as a major kind of progress in china's uh, strategy to supply chain resilience where because china tries to engage with these countries in terms of this that these countries are resource rich countries but also facing resource paradox while china having a geo, being a key geo, leading geo economic player is engaging with these countries and trying to uh, update uh, or secure its access for the future so when a in a geo economic engagement when a country has a lot of resources and a country with less resources or like with, with a high advanced geo economic or economic potential two mm -hmm. countries always engage in that way uh that creates an interdependence mm -hmm. between the two which china has been following since uh the past like we we don't even know, know how long back it goes and then importing also so it, it china in terms of along with engagement along with investment china has been trying to increase in is importing from the emerging players because there are countries which has which has a lot of unt untapped reserves a lot of potential to be a key supplier mm -hmm. for the world in future but at the same time they they lack the economic potential to be that supplier like china where china comes in and china is trying to import from these countries to have us uh, to support them strategically and also secure their access 
so in the key country in this is myanmar china has been importing a lot from myanmar even during the the coup uh, happened in myanmar during 2019 and 2020 china really struggled uh, that time because china was importing from myanmar and that time uh, all the exports and uh, were were from myanmar were uh, stopped and were put on stake when that time china was really struggling but then when the coup was uh, uh, like cleared and it was uh, the whole trading was open china again started uh, engaging with myanmar and still myanmar is a key supplier of uh, rare earth elements rare earth raw materials to china if you see the progress in lithium investment china has been engaging with these countries like mostly the its companies are there they are working in billion billion yuan and uh, they have been engaging with countries of africa south america and also sometimes with australia but now australia is not in even that being uh, uh, engaging with china that much which it used to in the past but africa and south america has been the major targets or major focus of china and you can see how much uh, investment china has been doing and this is like lot uh, too much shopping spree is like a lot of uh, shopping a lot of uh, investment a lot of buying or a lot of importing in a very short period of time which china has been doing in the past 30 um, 10 or 12 years and if you see the dominant uh, the nickel mining china has not as such uh, great reserves of nickel in comparison to other countries especially of uh, uh african or uh, region or also the south american region so uh, recently china got, got the access to the major uh, nickel project in in the world that is in indonesia and uh, if it uh, china is now very secure with its nickel uh, sources because uh indonesian uh indonesian nickel is the highest amount of sources for the world and us and china were in in kind of a tussle a kind of uh, you know competition how to get uh, indonesia under their control and china got uh, indonesia so we can see that china is secure with rare earth china is secure with lithium china is secure with nickel how because they have there are the strategies which try which china try to cope up china try to work upon over the years when the world when it's only just saw the light that the other countries are trying to shift from china and if we see the production and export quotas, yes. So China always uh, export, uh, impose the export curve using its, uh, uh, you know, the giving the reason of ex uh, export quota that we our environmental regulation are not allowing us to export right now. So yes, we are the China is putting export curve. So it has been all uh, it has been raised in WTO multiple times in 20, 2009, 12, 2016, and even 2018 was raised and recently we have seen the china has uh, done the export curve so it has been raised multiple times in wto but the result has been not the not very great the result has been not only in that way that the other countries have realized the importance and they have moved towards uh, securing their partnership in that way but uh, other ways the production and export quotas is the major strategy china uses whenever it fe feels like the other countries are being reliant and it it wants to show how how much reliant the other countries are so it, the, the we have seen multiple examples and then yes the geoeconomics with chinese characteristics so we have seen the chi chi how china has been developed over the years and china has the potential to become key or highest economic player in the world by 2030 uh, which shows uh, how much china has the power in terms of finances in terms of strategies in terms of research and development everything china has been strategizing in in uh, those terms but at the same time the challenges uh, challenges are there which china has to cope up with which obviously geoeconomics with Chinese characteristics is very different with geoeconomics of other countries, which we have seen in the past, we have we will be seeing in the future. And then uh, and in the last, I want to explain three kinds of dynamics here. So if we see the dynamics inside Chinese supply chain, mostly after discussing the whole scenario, I can see the, the dynamics inside Chinese supply chain shows highest kind of... Uh, decrease when illegal mining uh, is uh, increasing 
and if illegal mining is going to increase it going to affect the chinese prices and even the international prices but at the same time the world is going to get a lot of so world is going to get a lot of sources from these illegal minings which are going to affect chinese uh, update and growth but at the same time with chinese environmental regulation and exchange markets it can always uh, develop that kind of security that can uh, affect the global supply re resilience in terms of negative way and uh, give a positive advantage to china but at the same time if we see the impact for the world this is going to affect negatively for the world whenever china is going to impose quotas and taxes uh, in the future and in the past we have seen and in terms of wto and international regula regulation it can have some kind of positive hope but uh, that is also subjective uh, hope for all the countries and if we see the impact on global supply chain international standards uh, are ne next to zero chinese import imports of rare earth elements are increasing that can affect chinese uh, secu security about around critical minerals and that can increase the positivity or positive growth for the world chinese investment in uh, 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 other projects globally is all always going to affect global supply chain but at the same time if china is going to uh, engage with other countries which are high import dependent it can also increase import dependent it can also increase the supply chain resilience for countries like us and australia but that is the, that is something we have to see in the future these are the image sources and thank you for your attention thank you thank you very much neha that was an excellent uh, presentation a uh, lot of uh, data there you have obviously done a lot of very painstaking research thank you very much um now farah i am not able to see the chat box uh, from where i am so uh, i am going to request you to tell me how many questions are there in the chat box right now okay so currently there are no questions in the chat box but we do have someone who has raised his hand so okay so, so while yourself, one minute farah I yes, think sir. what I will do I'll, uh, until more people raise their hand or ask questions. I have one question to ask uh, Neha, and then after that we will go into the chat box. So Neha, my question is this: You okay. explained that the United States actually had an early lead in uh, in this whole area of critical minerals and rare earths. but due to environmental reason they shut down or slowed down their uh, investment in this area and uh, thereafter china was the main country that took this whole field up and progressed very rapidly in the way that you have shown so does this mean um and th these are the implications of what you said china decided to continue with all these uh, um investigations production capacity building etc despite the environmental damage that has happened so is that damage still happening or has china found a way to produce these large volumes with lesser environmental damage and if indeed environmental damage is happening and no way has been found around it then is this going to be the price for other countries to pay when they start uh, exploiting their own reserves so what is the trade off over here uh, that's my question yes uh, so in terms of environmental li limits yes in 1980s uh, it was in the environmental regulation that caused us uh, industry to decline but uh, when china start, china re realized the importance and it decided to enter into this industry the major uh, major reason was only that if we will enter if china wanted to enter it it could not enter with the same 
kind of environmental issues which USA had. So I mentioned during my presentation that the, there was a, the main credit goes back to Professor Shu Guanxian. He he was the major uh, major he gets the major credit for Chinese rare earth industry because he was uh, he revol revolutionized the whole process of mining and extracting and processing rare earth with the lim not very obviously they can't be no uh, environmental issues when you are extracting rare earth but he came up with a chemistry which uh, reduced the environmental cost when you are extracting processing the rare earth elements that kind that gave china a, a strength and even today in with that since that day to today since that year to today China started to focus on research and development in multiple ways. It has been trying to work on all new techniques that can reduce the environmental cost and uh, bring more, more and more uh, rare earth element mined for it. Uh, even comparison to USA, even USA try, try to come back into this domain when Molycorp, the major supplier from China, from USA, it came up in 2011 and 2015. Also, they they came they started to re restart. They start try to restart their production, but again they didn't have that environmental low environmental cost technique which China had. So, even in like in just within one year, they had to shut down again. And now China and uh, US has again uh, started, which uh, and also doing great. But again, it is all uh, with low environmental cost techniques. But again, we can't work with low environmental cost for all the time. We have to go for the no, no environmental cost, which uh, China is working on, which other countries are working on. And if any country is entering into this domain, they are trying to figure out the no environmental cost. If we see in this case, if we see the case of Japan, Japan has no reserves available of rare earth element, but still it is a major pa part of this uh, rare earth uh, industry. Why? Because it is working on recycling. And recycling is uh, in itself a very cost costly process, but no with with, with zero environmental cost. So there comes uh, uh, there is a uh, there is a option, there is an alternative, but uh, it all depends on how much expenses you can brought in, how much investment you can come come up with. So it's it always depends on that. But yes, if other countries are working on it, it they should come up with no no environmental cost. For, because that would come up, that would help them to have a long term growth and supply chain resilience. Thank you, thank you, Neha. Let's have the uh, raised hand question first, and then go one by one in the chat box. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Subhadeep Mondal, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Hello. I hope I am audible. Yes, you're audible. Yeah, thank you for, uh, for this opportunity. I must first thank the speaker and the chair for this elaborate session. Uh, first, uh, my question is regarding, uh, there's, as, in, as the speaker mentioned, that the China has a greater share in terms of the uh, supply chain. So recently, the China has consolidated all the rare companies under one issue that is China rare group. So can a uh, speaker could elaborate that whether this state has increased the China's share on, uh, in terms of the monetary in the supply chain or it has, uh, this state hasn't been uh, much change in, in the whole, uh, in the larger picture. Second would be, uh, that is, the speaker has mentioned that Africa has been the major source of import of rare earth minerals for China. So uh, since the, the BRI, has expanded in African countries to a larger extent. So do we see the, the import has increased after BRI or uh, or the, it's other way around? And I have a small comment to make, if I may. Uh, that is... Uh, uh, can uh, we have the questions answered first? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, sir, yes, sir. Mr. Yes, Subhadeep, and uh, we'll give a chance to the other questions. We'll come back to the comment later. Thank okay, you. sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, Second question I understood, but first question I have to ask you again. So for the second question, yes, uh, chi the China's engagement with Africa in, in terms of critical minerals and rare earth elements has been uh, uh, gaining uh, gaining more strength in the past. 
but with bri yes it has been developed but bri is something which was a part of increasing the partnership or increasing the engagement with africa in terms of resources so if we we can in if you are asking how bri played a role in uh, china's engagement uh, in uh, resource engagement with africa uh, that's a more uh, reverse role china's engagement in african resources kind of played a role uh, how Ch china started engaging african countries in bri circle and that is how china has been trying to engage more because this is bri we all know that is called as win win partnership but it's not very win win partnership for all time it's always a, a, a partnership which make china win first and then the other so that's what uh, china uh, understood up about africa and started to engaging with africa in terms of bri the first question i didn't understand can you just repeat again yeah, yeah. i i am just saying in 2021 china has launched a su under the name of china rare earth group co limited it's a conglomeration of the top pre existing companies which are working on the rare earth so i am just asking that whether uh, this SEO has a bigger economic impact on the whole chain supply, or it just a step for the China has more put more uh, step in the supply chain. Yes, um, I believe yes. Uh, for for SEO and other platforms, China has been trying to engaging in terms of resources and geoeconomics. Uh, but SEO is not the only platform or uh, I, China does not need a platform right now to get the access to the market because uh, China already has that leverage upon all the um, like countries in terms of rare earth or critical mineral market. But yes, when it uh, was uh, announced, it was with the whole uh, understanding that th this organization will have a setup with SEO members. But uh, that is also under progress because all of the time, whenever they announce something that is uh, not, uh, unless until it's not implemented, you, you cannot talk about it because if, even when Afghanistan had uh, Taliban control, China uh, uh, in, uh, announced that we will be in, investing in Afghanistan rare earth reserves. But we don't see any growth in that direction in the past one year. So this is something uh, uh, I we, we can I can comment upon only when there is some implementation in the in the field. So okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. So let's go to the chat box, uh, Farah, if you can. Read the first question. Yes, sir. Um, the first question is by Dr. Alpana Verma. She is a business development manager, Hingbis Limited, UK. She says, thank you for your talk. Do you see these strategies of China to have monopoly on critical mineral as a usage of non-strategic power to achieve its goal of making China great again? Mm-hmm. That's the question now. Yes, uh, I, I was also reading. Hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, this is obviously the the goal of China to take uh, make the China great uh, power thing uh, a future. This is the future goal of China to become a great power in the region, in at global, at regional level, and everything. But with critical mineral resources and uh, and its supply chain monopoly. It is trying to have that control over the world. And whenever you are talking about a, a, a great power uh, potential, a country has a, a one economic potential over the world, a, a, coercion, a soft power uh, dominance or soft power uh, influence over the world. And then in terms of now the resources. So China has been uh, obviously very bad, very good in terms of economic uh, engagement or economic power. And then if, uh, in terms of soft power, China has been engaging with countries. China has been trying to establish Confucius Institute in multiple countries to have a, 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 its historical or ideological part, uh, engagement with countries. And in terms of resources, it is also trying to engage. So when the, these three layers of engagement will be that much great for a country, or you can turn into a great, you can turn into a potential great power. I won't say that it has all the potential to be the great power, but 
it is it has the future goal it has been always uh, stating all the uh, comments all the statements have that mentioned that china wants to be a great power in future have all the uh, strengths and initiatives in that direction so yes i believe uh, this is something in that direction thank you neha uh, next question please farah yes yes sir there is one question from sugandha tandan she says thank you for the enlight enlightening talk neha uh, she has a question regarding implementation of export quota by china what challenges do high import dependent countries face in reducing their dependence on china for critical mineral and how are they addressing these challenges mm -hmm. so uh, countries are trying to reduce their dependence on china in the past like since 2018 mostly in terms of challenges uh, as i explained during my presentation also that china has everything prepared in one place it is either, either it's mining producing processing of critical rare earth minerals or uh, and uh, critical minerals which china has while other countries which are trying to reduce the dependence on china for instance us or australia they don't have processing capacities available at at one place so if you take the case of australia australia has the power of extraction production but for processing australia has been sending the its extracted and produced uh, material to malaysia and malaysia has lamp uh, linus um, malaysian at production uh, limited uh, and they are try they have been trying to uh, engage with malaysia in this term because they they have they, they process in malaysia but at the same time they have environmental limits in malaysia even in malaysia the processing capacity is not high as comparison to china and also environmental lim lim cost is so much high that malaysia has been a uh, malaysian public has been protesting against uh, australia recently the, the the agreement got renewed and they uh, malaysian uh, people has been uh, stating some condition that this uh, these uh, this agreement has renewed but on some condition that you will try to reduce in, uh, environmental cost for malaysian uh, malaysian and, um, people and at the same time if we say that the case of usa usa and uh, is trying has been trying to engage with australia and uh, even now recently with african countries but again it has no not such high processing capacity so either way if you have high production high high minerals available but you cannot process them that way that can be used in the, your high end products you don't have that much potential to uh, be, reduce the dependency on a country which has everything available at one place obviously that uh, kind of reduce the production cost uh environmental cost we so if, if we keep it aside the production cost the pricing that is the challenge for other countries when they are trying to redu reduce dependency on china but but in the same at the same time we have other uh, uh, kind of initiatives going on which is a, a majorly focusing on developing downstream downstream capacity this is uh, the major go goal of all the countries which are trying to reduce their dependency on china so yeah Thank you, Neha. Um, the so there's a question, question on YouTube. Yes, uh, Mr. Vinay just just wrote here says that given the close U.S.-China relationship in the late 90s, 1970s through 1990s, and the fact that the China's benefit from U.S. technology transfer during this time, do you believe that the U.S. played a role of helping China become a leader in technology? No. that's not the case that is a leader in a leader in mining technology you mean is that to clarify the question is the, is the question question is saying that the us helped china in the early years 1970 to 1990 in developing yes. leadership in the rare earth and critical minerals field that's how i understand the question no just is by becoming correct? the leader in technology okay in technology uh, of what the question doesn't specify sir hmm no please can that person specify or while while he is doing it can we move on to the next question sir and there is another question i would request that i would request that person to clarify the question okay the next question uh 
it's by aditya hazarika advisor sk hazarika college guwahati says very interesting topic neha i wanted to ask if there is any possibility of a mineral supply control organization that can stand against the chinese dominance just like the oil producer organization mm -hmm. um if you are uh, talking about uh, international mineral secure supply control organization there are, there is an initiative going on that is mineral security partnership alliance that is a 15 countries alliance uh, between, leading by us and uh, in india recently became a part of it they have major goal uh, and they have stated it that they want to reduce dependence on china and uh, want to work on their uh, critical mineral supply chain resilience and in our terms of uh, domestic mineral supply control organization countries are working on that in that direction they have multiple uh, in uh, strategies in, uh, and policies if we take the especially if you take the case of australia australia has been re working really really good in this direction uh, australia has multiple uh, research and development uh, think tanks they are focusing on the, this initiative only and uh, they are researching around it and then they have uh, fundings uh, for mining they have fundings for strategy they have fundings for companies and uh, and but in terms of mineral supply control organization you have to be more specific about how you are con controlling the mineral supply if you are controlling the supply for domestic level or the international level because if you see the case of china china control always the export quota and everything which you have also asked that they they impose production quota export quota whenever they feel that uh, this is going against their pricing pricing strategy or globally they want to show the leverage so in case of other countries what are their their strategies are they have, when when a country decides so as i explained during my presentation also whenever you are th talking about critical minerals a country defines a critical minerals as critical based on uh, how much critical based on the criticality of it during a particular time and space and as per your need so it always depends on a country domestically what what that kind of Uh, scenario requires from you and in terms of international uh, we have seen our multiple initiatives and strategies are growing let's see how that will unfold in future thank you neha uh, um, let's move on tara uh, so mr vinay has confirmed and said okay. that he uh, the con question is in the context of leadership in mining extraction and processing technology okay thank you thank you for the clarification now neha you can answer that question uh no and that was not the case because uh, us never wanted to help china to, to be a leader in mining industry because this uh, mining industry is always a strength of a country if you are if a country is highly high, high resource uh, exporting capacity having the exporting capacity and leading Uh, the other countries uh, it always has a leverage on other countries which i which usa was enjoying till 1980s so i don't think china, us ever wanted to uh, shift or you know give give away that uh, leadership to china especially when china wanted to be a, a competition but uh, that time china didn't have that uh, much potential but even if that con and any country has no potential i believe china uh, usa will never give away uh, uh, a potential like this to any country so i don't think that was the case for me neha may i may i press you on that question because i think the questioner has got on to an important point in the 1980s as you yourself said the usa shut down its uh, uh, critical minerals facilities and rare earths because of environmental reasons therefore they wanted somebody else to do it right and bear the environmental cost without themselves doing it and china at that time had very good relations with the us so isn't it possible unless you are sure that they did not help isn't it possible that they might have helped china to develop this technology mining as far as i am concerned and i have re read about uh, the, this area USA didn't help China uh, 
but yes you can in that direction you this is something to think about that at that time us and china has a good connection but usa didn't support china in any way because china wanted to be uh, to advance this uh, rare earth industry specifically to be a challenge to uh, usa in future and uh, it has been claimed also in 1992 uh, when uh, tiao shaoping he said in his uh, statement that if middle east has oil china has rare earth that was shown that china uh, th that was a uh, kind of reflection on their confidence that if middle east can show the world with their oil crisis and with their oil uh, uh, you know power over other countries china can also show the world with its rare earth potential so for me yes it it is not it was not usa that helped china but at the same time uh, this is something to think about and look uh, up to yes thank you neha uh, i am glad this is turning out to be a very lively discussion uh, this subject has aroused a lot of interest as as, as we can see very good so uh, farah let's move on to the next question um, so before I ask any other question, can I pose a question of my own? Yes, please. Um, okay. Just last month, China imposed export control on two strategic raw materials, uh, namely gallium and germanium, that are critical to global chip making industry. So given the recent chip, China chip ban and its implication on global supply chain, how do you foresee this ban impacting China's strategy to sustain its monopoly on critical minerals? Also, what are the what are the potential ramifications for other countries who are heavily reliant on Chinese export for this mineral? Yes, um, in terms of um, how it it's going to impact uh, China's uh, security strategy around the critical minerals. Uh, when whenever you impose an export curve, it always goes in both directions. If you are taking, uh, if you are imposing export curve, it is causing cost uh, or it is causing harm to other countries' trade and our economy or defense uh, production. But at the same time, it is causing uh, um, you know loss to a country which is exporting to a because it is a market loss. It was a market loss. It is it is going to be a market loss for China as well, which China is will be needing to fill with other country or find a, an alternative market for China as well, which is going to be seen in future. But at the same time, in, in the mm -hmm. past, we have seen when 2011 even happened and when 2018-11 happened, in that time also, the USA was very against China, that how China did uh, the whole uh, export embargo against Japan. And they uh, also, uh, along with Japan, raised this issue in WTO. But after that, uh, in few years, China, USA started to import again from China. And then uh, that happened again. And in 2018, also that happened. And then if you are, uh, if USA was really claiming that we won't uh, be uh, importing from China. So it is a statement from Chinese uh, official uh, newspaper that uh, don't say if, uh, if you will continue this way, don't say we didn't warn you. That was a major uh, kind of uh, warning China claimed in, in its official statement. Still, uh, after some year, if you, you can see that USA started importing again from China, the gallium and germanium was being imported. So this is the case with the US and China that if uh, the, the, the decoupling is not very easy, easy happening for China and US and with, with China or other countries. And if ramification you are talking about, if other countries want that may uh, in in that way, yes, they want to seek alternative, or they want to seek uh, they have to seek alternative in terms of so resources from where they are bringing it up, and in terms of also domestic capacity, where other countries need to work on their domestic manufacturing. We, this is worth noticing and of mentioning that critical minerals are not and even the rare earth elements are not rare in terms of amount. They are uh, available in abundant amount. You have to see in the, your domestic level also how much you have. 
so which other countries are not very focusing up, uh, focusing upon if you are relying only on the uh, importing the, you, you will continuously rel continue to be a reliant and dependent person country so that is the thing that domestic level needs to be explored more if you have to reduce the re re dependency Thank you. And as an extension of that question, have there been any effort to develop alternate technologies or substitute that could potentially reduce the demand for specific critical minerals? Also, what role, if any, does WTO has or any other international body plays in addressing the concern related to critical mineral trade and China's monopoly? Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, alternative seeking, yes, uh, there are uh, there are initiatives going on, but they are very uh, you know uh, you can see their potential uh, how much they can grow in like long term potential they have after ten years or after fifteen years you can see if they have any impact because right now critical minerals have no alternative. Uh, critical minerals uh, are the real oil of current time. If you say, we, we have seen the statements like this, and in terms of uh, the other the other question was what was your other uh, question? Uh, any other international bodies or WTO? Mm -hmm. Do they have any uh, um, role in addressing the concern related to critical mineral trade and China's monopoly? Uh, they are next to nothing actually, uh, which I have read because mostly these cases have been raised in WTO, but WTO uh, give the decision after like multiple years, like four, five, six years. And till that time, uh, those countries which were raising the issue, they are again uh, dependent on China. So this is a vicious cycle which um, uh, China has created for other countries. So if you take the case of 2011 Senkaku Island dispute only, that was raised in WTO and everything was uh, around five, seven countries were raised, uh, raised uh, this uh, issue against China. And WTO gave the uh, decision in 2014 and 15. And then China just gave up, it could, it just gave this reason that I want, that China wanted to work on its uh, domestic production and it was costing a lot of environmental costs for China. That was the reason we did the export embargo. And then China could go away with uh, this reason and nothing happened against China. So no regulation, no uh, international body has been doing that much, uh, you know, restriction on China uh, in that way, because this is all uh, China can always go away with this ex production and export quota and production and export quota is noticeable that every country has that right. If you are exporting, if you if you have, think that domestic level is not getting high, uh, enough level of consumption, you can put quotas. So China always uh, give this reason and get get away. So that is the reason. Uh, you, can I ask you if there's no other question, uh, Bara? Um, no, sir. There's I no ask... other question on YouTube, nor in the chat I box. Will... Okay, I will. So, so ask that is one. Okay. That is one. That's again by Sukhanda Tandon. She is the research assistant uh, in ICS. She says, okay. Could you please elaborate on the decision by Japan automakers like Toyota and Honda to remove rare earth elements from the car? Uh, uh, and how is it, how is this, uh, how this move impacting the supply chain and overall production process? Yes, uh, this is a, a decision more in terms of their, their focus on recycling and uh, going beyond rare earth elements. But again, uh, I just said that this is a, a future development. So it, Japan has uh, decided to do so, but how much uh, production capacity they will have, how much life or how much age they will have, that needs to be seen. And once it will be seen, obviously uh, they, we will have one alternative available, which the world is seeking. So this is uh, right now going on. And this is go this is not going to impact the supply chain as such, because uh, there is a, I, I attended one conference in uh, Spain uh, regarding rare earth elements. And there was a mentioning, there was a mention by a, a session that the countries have very um, companies, especially they have very low control, low confidence in uh, something that is uh, recycled. 
they feel that this is not going to work for future so countries are very reluctant to use that much uh, so this is going to impact this is not going to impact the supply chain as much uh, as uh, we are thinking unless and until it is not going to show a good good uh, you know positive development or growth so that's yet to be seen thank you neha uh, let me ask you a question at this stage that do you think the position of china mm -hmm. in the rare earths and critical minerals uh, field today in terms of its bargaining power and uh, dominant position is similar to what Taiwan and the US have in terms of their critical position and dominance in the semiconductor chip situation. And if so, is China aiming at, at some point, at some kind of grand bargain that I will release the minerals and you release the uh, chips. Is that possible? Uh, with China, it, uh, with, uh, with US, it is not because China does not need uh, US uh, to export any kind of critical minerals as such right now. Uh, but with Naiwan, yes, it, it, it has the potential uh, because China has, has the highest interest in Taiwan semiconductor uh, supply chain. Th China has been in investing, China has been engaging a lot. And it, they, you can see that how China has been very concerned about U.S. engagement with Taiwan because China knows, uh, China has that fear that if China, U.S. and Taiwan will be engaging in that much and they have a strong partnership in semiconductor supply chain, that is going to cost a uh, high level of, uh, you know, loss for China. Because uh, it, even if, uh, so one thing you should know that the whole supply chain of critical minerals or semiconductor, it is not a one single country uh, success or one single country process. You cannot survive in a uh, critical mineral chain or semiconductor supply chain uh, so um, in a like isolated way. You have to, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a cycle. You have to pass this uh, extracted product to this country and then manufacture here and then and everything goes here and here. So that's what, how it happens with Taiwan and China also. China and Taiwan has a connection. If you see, if we go back to, uh, there was a time when uh, China used to, uh, China used to manufacture uh, a lot of, uh, chips and batteries in Taiwan, which which was, I, I, I'm not aware right now that how much it is progress right now. But in terms of uh, even the Apple iPhone, it used to be manufactured in Taiwan previously. There was a, a city of, of uh, Apple I, manufacturing Apple iPhones. So uh, how much they have uh, contributed in that direction, Taiwan, we have seen and they, it has a high uh, kind of economic and strategic significance in the supply chain but at the same time how much role uh, like how china can bargain in terms of critical minerals it is uh, not seen that much because china never bargained that uh, that way china just put one export embargo to show to show its leverage that we you uh, th these countries the world is dependent on me and on my uh, export capacity. And once it is shown that it, it is again restored, so it is always has been done, but I have never, uh, in my uh, uh, knowledge, I have never seen how much uh, like China has done any bargaining with uh, curbing the export of uh, any kind of critical mineral in the past. It has always tried to show its uh, uh, confidence and show its uh, leverage. But in future, yes, we, we have, if the countries like uh, free Myanmar, especially Myanmar has the potential of rare earth. Uh, Taiwan has semiconductor supply chain, uh, significance in semiconductor supply chain. So how these countries are going to engage with other countries if, if, uh, um, along with China, it's going, to un it's going to unfold all the dynamics in the supply chain. So that's, it's, uh, that is something yet to see. And yes, I, I also need to explore more. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. Uh, there are many ramifications in, in what you said. In fact, the intertwining of supply chains really 
what it is telling us is that this whole question of decoupling, even de-risking, because what does de-risking mean, um, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, is far more complicated than we realize. And perhaps it may become very much more complicated before we find a way out of it. Uh, now, Farah, we are nearing the uh, last few minutes. So is there any other question on the YouTube or in the chat box? Uh, no, so there is no question on the YouTube, nor there is any in the chat box. Right. So uh, I think then we can draw this session to a close. I'd like to once again uh, thank Neha for this very fine presentation and your uh, very uh, spirited coping with uh, a large number of questions. As you can see, this has elicited very great interest. So I would recommend that you pursue uh, this subject uh, thoroughly because it is going to keep us on our toes for uh, quite some time to come, I think. So uh, having said that, let me thank all the participants let me thank you, Neha. Let me thank Farah and everyone in ICS uh, behind the screens, behind the screen who has kept the show on the road and wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Bhutalingam. Thank, thank you, Farah. Thank you, Snigna. And thank you, ICS, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And, and yes, you said it right. I will continue moving in this direction and I hope I, it can contribute in any uh, future uh, research uh, community around critical minerals. So that's our goal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. With this, we would wrap the session. We thank Ms. Mishra and Mr. Budalingam for giving us their precious time and holding an engaging conversation. The video recording of today's discussion will be available on ICS YouTube platform. We would also like to welcome everyone for the next sem Wednesday seminar. We at ICS conduct seminar every Wednesday. Information related to the same will be available on the ICS website and our, and our social media. You can also follow our Twitter and subscribe to our newsletter for regular update, updates. Thank you. Thank you.